We're here outside of Lovell, Wyoming today at Fort Causeway, visiting with Kevin and Carrie Schultes and their family. So tell us a little bit about what your, uh, what your basic production cycle is here on the farm. What, what do we grow, Caleb? We grow forage. You grow forage. Basically, that's what we've started. It's root, root farmers. It's uh, anything growing down is going to be a benefit for us when we look at this typical or atypical compacted pasture. That's what we're looking at if we don't nurture something responsible. This is called the Blue 80. It was available because nobody wanted it. 80 acres of blue bentonite soil, not worth farming. And we wonder whether it's just been hammered a little bit longer than other pieces of ground around here, and, and it just needs a little bit of input. What's your land market? Go a little bit into what you're, what you sell. We're, we're still feeling our way through that. Mm -hmm. We're really just getting to the point where we have enough product to sort of play more with restaurants, grocery stores. You know, we started with four sheep a few years ago, and now we have over 400. Mm -hmm. They're a great animal. They taste good. We're finding our markets are not necessarily local, which is we do like to support local and grow local. We're really on the starting point. We're, we also are selling our lamb online and both through our own website. And we just got a page going on Amazon to sell meat. You can buy meat on Amazon. I had no idea. No. <laughs> <laughs> but for people maybe looking at a system like this with smaller acreage, it, you know, you can take all your lambs to the sale barn. And right now the price is really good. You know, this is a good option for someone maybe with a smaller acreage that wants to do something with their land, increase their soil health while they are growing a, a product that people do want. Yeah. And it's a, it's a good product, even if you're just growing it for your family, the meat mm -hmm. is good and it's mm -hmm. healthy. You know, the sheep are such a nice animal that mm -hmm. these kids can help and sit around them and handle mm -hmm. them. And it works well for a young family, I think. That's a great we, idea. We kind of felt our way through it. We raised 30 hogs and then had 40 sheep and 500 chickens and a milk cow and we've kind of done farmers markets as a family and kind of tested some markets out and and uh, and, and we kind of thought we better we kind of picked the sheep because they did the most for our soil mm -hmm. while finishing well themselves we knew we could raise healthy nice tasting mm -hmm. sheep while they're benefiting the soil program we're trying to implement right. Tell me a little bit more about this circle here on this diagram. Well, basically this is a way to not only help fix nitrogen into our soil by using things that grow during different seasons, but also a way to extend our grazing season. Since we have perennial pastures in now to help keep the tilth that we make in the ground without it blowing away, everyone around here said cool season grasses, they do great in the spring and the fall, but they just shut down in the summer. And Kevin has implemented some pasture cropping so that we can no-till seed in warm season annuals and legumes into our cool season grass perennial pastures during the warmer months. So from you know about mid-June to end of August or so is the target season kind of for when we want those warm season annuals to grow. So they provide tonnage for forage. We try to find annuals that help fix nitrogen into the soil so when the cool season starts back mm -hmm. up the grass can start taking off again. Um, what we're finding though is with doing the no-till subsoiling and getting those grass roots down deeper our grass is not shutting off as much during the warmer season so we're actually having to go through no-till subsoil or um, stress the grass mm -hmm so that these warm season annuals will come up. We're finding some that compete fairly well, some that don't like to compete. Uh, we no-till seeded some. We, we no-till seeded subsoiled some. Alan Savory has some great information of uh, hoof action in alkali mm -hmm. soil, and we're mimicking that 10 inches on center with a vibra shank to stress that grass. So we dig a hole in our pasture, and we find the root depth, and we run this four inches behind the root depth every year. Next year, we might go a little deeper. This also lifts the soil and gives us a real good corrugation and watermark. We're having some problems with plasticity and, and wrecking the soil structure by running it in flood irrigated land. We're gonna start running it uh, when there's three inches of frost in the ground, letting it mellow. And that's another thing that the old boys told us, the only way to farm this heavy ground is to plow it in the fall and let it mellow all winter. In order to get roots growing deep, we need to deal with tilth. And this no-till subsoiler does that. 
I grew up thinking subsoiling was the deepest you can go until the tires spin or the motor bogs out and you're subsoiling, baby. And this is nurturing your roots deeper. So you use as little horsepower as possible because the organic matter is the thing that kicks everything off. So then the question is, how do we get it in soils that have had none? Because we don't have tilth, our organic matter can't go deeper. So we said, how can we make that a deeper system? We knew that out of all the plants you can grow, a rhizome spreading grass is the number one soil builder. That's how the grasslands of Nebraska produce such good soil. It was because of a grass breaking off, dying with tilth, bugs eating that, making a living system. So what are some of your workhorses in terms of the different forage varieties that you're using throughout the seasons here? For the perennial, it's a garrison creeping foxtail base here and then alfalfa and red clover is what we're trying to keep as a spring and fall. Part of this program is anything green that grows that sheep will eat without it becoming a weed bed deficiency is the program. It starts with a patch of garrison creeping foxtail in a weed patch and the weed patches are getting smaller while our perennial base is getting bigger. And so we'll see barley foxtail with garrison and a sprig of red clover and alfalfa and bindweed. And the next year, the stuff we want is actually come, coming on. So, so some of your cool season perennials start to slow down in about June. And then what comes in? What are your warm season uh, annuals that come in, in the middle of the summer there? Those are the crops that we actually no-till in. So this year we did a sorghum, Sudan grass, a sun hemp and a radish, small grains, oats, and barley, and pea, actually. So it was quite a mix, it sounds like. It was, and we tried different things mm -hmm. in different areas. Mm -hmm. We put on 100 pounds of annual rye. You're supposed to be guaranteed tonnage. Nothing came up, but it's coming up three years later. Mm -hmm. So we've adopted a program of a whole bunch of seed a given amount per acre, a dollar amount of seed per acre per year. And as we get too much grass, we'll put in more legumes. As we have bare spots, we'll put in more annuals. And we're really looking at plants per foot grazed and we're not having to spray. So it works out for us. So the sorghum, when it grows three to four feet tall and we graze it once, the sorghum throws down a secondary root system after that sorghum is done for the year, those root systems and the secondary is now a pathway for our perennial crops to get down deep. Mm -hmm. One of the things we're doing is different is a crazy combination. Big horsepower, small width. I've been seeding and then no-till subsoiling and that's two trips with heavy equipment. So I'm trying to reduce that. We're experiencing a lot of funny things about germination. We're getting results six months, a year later, two years later. We know our inputs. We have to be patient. It's not a control your whole field. It's part of why we're putting a lot of different things in there. One thing I started doing is looking at the health of our soil by flipping cow pies. But how glued down are they to the soil? What we're finding is when we get into a, an alfalfa field that has run cows, next door to a grass field. The cow pies in a grass-based organic system that hasn't been treated is completely desiccated with a lot of microbial and worm evidence. Whereas in, in a lot of the hay alfalfa fields, that cow pie stays there untouched. The top inch of our soil is the seed growing medium. That's where it gets started. Until you get that top inch fixed, you're pushing a rope. This alkali crust is a killer for germination and establishment of turf-based systems. They won't fill in. So we started by running a wheel rake and scratching the soil and grass started popping up. But we sold the hay equipment, so how do we do it now? Ideally, the sheep traction. But really, once the sheep are there and the sun hits that soil, it's a baked alkali crust. We've had really good results throwing hay residue out, watering heavy. And the interesting thing that life has started in this soil that residue becomes a mat, and 60 days later, there's nothing left, but there's things growing. It disappears. Where we're leaving residue, we're finding exponential germination rate increases. The whole take, take, take from infertile soil, it hasn't worked for us. We have to invest in this before we can expect something from it. When I moved here, they said that there's a clay drain running parallel to the highway about 20 feet off. And we just started digging. And here we found it. 
and it was full of sand. And we dug it halfway in the property and it was half full of sand. So water is coming into the property, not going out, and everyone says it's no good. Well, we found out that farther in this property, about 80 feet down, it's plugged solid. So the way to mitigate this is underground drainage, downward movement of water through the soil profile. So I open this up and put pipe in, and then once we go ahead and are finished irrigating, I can open that valve and it can drain as needed. And you open it this morning, water's just boiling through, 10 inch pipe full of water, just boiling out. So looking for 50% soil, 50% air and water, all the data's out there, how do we do it here? We really started by throwing seed at it and we were good till June, but we knew we were gonna fail. So we started asking a lot of questions and, and a local rancher that had his 2000 third generation acre local ranch foreclosed on. I said, how do I fix water management? And he says that you can't do it here. And three weeks later, he came back and he gave me some information about a no-till subsoiler. And he says, I think if I had done this, uh, I wouldn't have lost my ranch. That's motivated us, some of those stories. We had to decide for our family, are we killing things as farmers or are we growing things? And this is a system, anything that grows in this hostile climate is a benefit. Management of the growth is up to us, but farming for me is now about growing things. It's not about keeping a lot of things from growing.